8. Trapped. Here we are, love, said the fat woman. She had led Ace through a maze of twisting back streets, and now they had stopped outside a shabby little cafe. It had been formed by putting a big front window and a door over the front of a disused railway arch. The whole place reeked of seediness and decay. The once bright green paint was shabby and peeling, and the lace curtains over the steamed-up windows were grimy and tattered. Above the door was a notice board, ornate letters in cracked gold paint. The Cosy Café. Prop H. Barker. The fat woman saw Ace looking at the sign. That H was my Harry, she said. Captured with the rest at Dunkirk, never saw him again. I kept the place going just in case. Come on inside. She led the way into a murky, curved ceiling room, like a sectioned off bit of tunnel. Rickety wooden chairs and tables filled the main body of the room, and there was a counter across the far end. The place felt warm and cosy and curiously safe. Behind the counter was a steaming tea urn and a tall, white haired old man. He was polishing the counter with a grimy duster and he looked strangely familiar. Hello, Ma, he shouted. Let you out, have they? Got caught up in one of them random freak ops suite, didn't I? Just the old routine, check up nonsense, round up the usual suspects. Don't know why they bother. Ace came to a halt. Hang on a minute. She turned to the fat woman. You're Ma Barker, and this is your cafe. That's right, love. You own the place I was looking for, and we just happened to finish up on the same truck. Life's full of little coincidences, Ducky, said Ma Barker placidly. Yeah? Well, this little coincidence is too big for me, said Ace. I think I'll just leave. Oh, I don't think you can do that, Ducky, said Ma Barker. Not till we've had a nice little chat. Can she, Pop? I'm afraid it's out of the question, my dear young lady, said the old man. His voice had altered, and he had a huge service revolver in his hand. Ma Barker waddled to the front door, locked it, turned the hanging sign round to closed, and bustled Ace up to the counter. Get the young lady a nice cup, huh, Pop? One for me and you as well. The old man poured three cups of tea into thick china mugs and nodded to a tin sugar bowl on the counter. Close to it, chained to the counter, was a sugar-encrusted spoon. Ace took a swig of tea. It was hot and strong, and it really tasted of tea. Ma Barker slurped her tea with noisy satisfaction. Anything for sandwiches? Got some real butter and a nice bit of ham under the counter, said Pop. Fell off a free core lorry. From under the counter, he produced a chunk of ham, a long, thin knife, a loaf of bread, and a packet of butter. He put down the revolver within easy reach. Easy for him not for Ace, took a bread knife from a drawer and began cutting the bread. Ma Barker took the long knife and started slicing the ham. Now then, ducky, she said. Who are you and what do you want here? Ace nodded towards the old man. You asked me here, at the festival. You were painting some railings that didn't need painting. Well, I asked your friend, didn't I? said Pop. Little fella in the funny hat. What's happened to him? He's busy, said Ace. That's why he sent me instead. Ah, but to do what? said Ma Barker. Ace tried to remember the doctor's instructions. They weren't much help. Just talk to them, Ace, he'd said. You can't tell them who we are and where we've come from. They'd never believe you. You can't say what we're really after. They'd never believe that either. Just say we've come to help. Find out all you can about what's been happening here since the war started and since England lost. See if you can find any suggestion of alien interference, anything that tastes of time worm. He'd paused and added sternly, and don't give them any nitro nine. Ace became aware that Pop and Ma Barker were looking at her expectantly. She looked at the gun close to Pop and the long knife in Ma Barker's hand and realised that she was talking for her life. The doctor and I come from somewhere far away, she said. Don't ask me where, I can't tell you. America? asked Pop. That blue box was never made in this country. Canada, suggested Ma Barker. The government in exile? Never mind, said Ace. Believe me, you don't need to know. With a sudden inspiration, she added, and what you don't know, they can't make you tell. To her relief, her audience nodded agreement. We've come here to see if we can help you, she went on. But to do that, we need to know what things have been like here since the war. The two of them looked at her in suspicious silence. Look, said Ace desperately, I'm not asking for any secrets, all right? 
I don't want to know anything the Nazis don't already know. No names, no places. I just want to know about all the everyday stuff about what's been going on here. All the things you know and we don't because you've been here and we haven't. Pop and Mar Barker looked at each other. Don't see the arm in it, said Mar Barker. Pop said, may as well go along with it for the time being. They began to talk. They told her of the lightning invasion, the German troops in Whitehall before anyone realised what was happening. Soon after that, they signed the Anglo-German Treaty, said Pop. Just another name for surrender, that was. And then they put him back on the throne, said Mar Barker. And er, uh, that American bird he ran off with, she sniffed. Queen Wallace! Go on, said Ace. What happened after that? Apparently there had been instant arrest for anyone reckoned even a potential danger to the Reich. Civil servants, ex-officers, trade unionists, lawyers, any MPs who didn't get away, said Pop. They'd got blacklists already. They'd made a pretty clean sweep. And I don't have to tell you what happened to the Jews, said Mar Barker. And the gypsies and the invalids and anyone else they thought was useless. Next had come the mass deportations. The voluntary labour force, said Mar Barker. Voluntary? <laughs> That's a laugh. Every able-bodied male between 17 and 45 was just scooped up and taken away, said Pop. Ace remembered how, apart from the occupying forces and their hangers-on, they'd seen any women and children and old people. What happened to them? Sent to the continent. Slave labour, said Pop. They're strengthening Fortress Europe, helping to build New Berlin. Pretty well worked to death, so I hear. Anyway, no one ever comes back. Women too, said Mar Barker. Only the blue-eyed blondes, though. Sent to race centres to have kids by those SS bastards. The idea is to educate the kids in Germany and send them back here when they've grown up into good Nazis. Just about everything of any value was shipped back to Germany, said Pop. Art treasures, industrial equipment, the lot. They've left a poor and empty country full of old people, most of them half starved and worked to death. As soon as they've killed us off, they'll colonise the place with nice pure-blooded Aryans. English people will have ceased to exist. What about you lot then? asked Ace. You seem to be keeping your end up. We do what we can, Ducky, said Mar Barker. Bit of thieving, bit of sabotage. Bit of knocking off Nazi officials and chucking them in the river, suggested Ace. Pop cut another slice of ham with the long, thin knife. We got a tip some Nazi bigwig was coming over to tighten things up. It seemed like a good idea to discourage him. You mean murder him? Not murder. War, said Pop. But you're a civilian. On the contrary said Pop in his different voice. I'm a major in the British Army, at least I was, when there still was a British Army. I was one of Colonel Gubbin's auxiliary units, ordered to go underground after the invasion. I never surrendered. As far as I'm concerned, the war is still on. He passed Ace a ham sandwich. She sat there munching, wondering if she'd learned anything the Doctor would find useful. Did anything weird or odd or unusual happen during the invasion? Pop looked puzzled. Not that I can think of. Well, there was a battle we lost. Once the army had been captured in France, we'd got practically nothing left to fight them with. And there was nothing else, persisted Ace. He frowned. I'm not really sure what you're getting at. Neither am I, confessed Ace. It's just that I was specifically told to ask about anything weird or offbeat. What about all that black magic stuff, suggested Mar Barker. Pop snorted. Lots of superstitious nonsense. Tell me, demanded Ace. Mar Barker lowered her voice. Around the time of the invasion, some people were saying Hitler couldn't lose because the devil was on his side. He was supposed to have these black magicians working for him. They cursed all them freak storms that wrecked the navy, and jinxed the fine weather for the invasion, put a jinx on our leaders, stuff like that. They were called the Black Coven. Lots of silly rumours, insisted Pop. Soon died out, didn't they? Only because we made sure they did. Who made sure? asked Ace. Them nasties. Any mention of the Black Coven was subversive talk, punishable by death. No wonder people shut up about it. Ma Barker lowered her voice with a sort of ghoulish relish. They're supposed to be in Germany still, helping old Hitler, telling him how to conquer the world. They live in this great castle somewhere, and they have evil rituals and human sacrifices. Only like Pop says, we're not supposed to know, and we ain't allowed to talk about it. So the Nazis still take the story seriously. And don't want a bunch of mumbo-jumbo chaps in black robes stealing all the credit, said Pop. Mind you, they always were a superstitious lot. Hitler's had his own astrologer for years, and apparently him was right round the bend. Someone rattled the door. Pop grabbed his revolver, holding it out of sight under the counter. 
Ma Barker snatched up the long knife. She went to the door and peered out through the glass. It's all right, it's only old Arnie. She opened the door and a furtive little figure slipped through. Ma Barker closed the door and locked it again. I came to warn you, said the little man. There's a big free court operation planned for this area. He broke off, staring at Ace. What's she doing here? It's a long story, said Ma Barker. It'll be a bloody short one if you don't get rid of her, snapped the little man. She's with the free corps. I saw her and her friend just yesterday, riding round in one of their limousines. Ace felt the cold steel of Ma Barker's knife at her throat.